Hello, this is Father Rich. I'm here in the main office hallway of the, uh, the church, Our Lady of Peace. And here in front of the pictures of the pastors, the three pastors who uh, had served here at Our Lady of Peace for at least 10 years, our founding pastor, Monsignor James Daly, um, who was here, as the plaque says, uh, no, it doesn't say, but he was here from uh, 1957 until 1981. Monsignor Ernie Daly, pastor from 1986 to 1999. Father Tom Brooks, I don't know if you can see him at this angle, but he's down there at the end, uh, pastor from 99 to 2009. So we're grateful to them. And these are kind of ways to honor them and memorialize them. And this next uh, masterpiece that we're doing is called The Burial of the Count of Orgaz. Uh, this is our 16th masterpiece and it's by El Greco a painter uh, of Greek origin, but ended up his most famous and long-standing work done in Spain. And this, uh, the, the, the picture that he did, which is, is in the church at Santo Tome in Toledo, Spain, where he ended up um, the last part of his life and really flourishing, it, um, it's a picture of a tradition, a legend about this count who had been very supportive of the church, very holy, was very well uh, beloved by the community. And the tradition was that St. Augustine and St. Stephen had both miraculously appeared at the time of his funeral uh, to assist in the burial of his body. So the actual painting by El Greco depicts that, that moment at the bottom um, with many of some counts and different noblemen gathered around and the priest at that area. But then up above, it has a very kind of mystical, otherworldly, heavenward, uh, depiction of the the soul being presented to um, God with Mary there and Jesus, etc. It also has a portrait of the son of the artist um, and as well as a self-portrait. So kind of depicts all kinds of timing. And that's one of the things that they said that El Greco had a knack for doing is really bringing in the past, the present, the future, the otherworldly, and this world. Um, really towards the end of his, his painting, um, moving away from the not not getting as caught up in the naturalism of the um, of the Renaissance at that time, but kind of more of a mystical painter. They actually mention at the time. Remember that in the time this this the painting was 1586 was in the time of the Protestant Reformation, but also the time of the Catholic Counter Reformation and some of these great Spanish saints that rose up. Uh, two particularly Saint Teresa of Avila, Saint John of the Cross who were great mystics, uh, doctors of the church, and had these incredible kind of mystical, not only uh, prayer experience with God, in, but also writings about that communion with God, the contemplation with God. And so they don't, we don't know of a direct influence there, but it's hard to suggest that they're not there because there's almost like he, um, he wasn't as worried about depicting what was happening physically but more about what was happening spiritually in the moment. And um, so that's really a unique element of how he, uh, how he drew. They actually mentioned that the, the three influences on, um, uh, major influences on El Greco were the uh, Venetian painters. When he moved from Greece, he was actually from Greece. His name was, if I can get this, Domenikos Theotokopoulos. Um, he was born in the island of Crete in 1541, but as he moved around, his friends, particularly in Italy and Spain, couldn't pronounce his name, so they called him El Greco, the Greek, and that's the name that kind of stuck with, stuck with him. But they mentioned that, um, so the Venetian masters definitely had an influence, um, and th also the, the naturalism of the portraits. Early on, because he, when he was going to Venice, he went to Rome eventually, uh, even his time in Greece and in Madrid before he made his way to Toledo and really started getting support. They mentioned he was just doing anything to make some money. So he did a lot of portraits and a lot of smaller devotional kind of paintings. And it's so he mentions kind of the naturalism of that he had developed as a portrait painter, that they say that kind of a representational skill he had picked up from the Venetian painters, and then the powerful expressiveness he learned from the later work of Michelangelo really had an influence on his work that he did in Spain. Now, interestingly enough, they mentioned, they say that he left Rome uh, to go to Madrid because he had a falling out with Michelangelo. He criticized the last judgment that Michelangelo had done. So he, he, he found out, fell out of favor of most people in Rome because Michelangelo was so well liked and 
uh, highly revered, so he left town, so to speak, but he still couldn't help but be influenced by his painting and his style, which he would bring with him to Spain. Um, so they kind of say that by the time he died in 1614, the, the naturalism of Caravaggio, who we're gonna, the next painting we're gonna do is Caravaggio, um, had, had taken over the realism of that, the intense realism. And so the style of El Greco kind of fell out of, out of favor by the time he died in 1614. Uh, one of the things that I think of when I see an El Greco or what makes me be able to identify an El Greco, and later on in his painting, he kind of almost made the heads almost flame-like. Everything in the picture kind of has this flame, you know, uh, almost posture of it that kind of feels like it's the Holy Spirit kind of in that kind of mystical sense of the spiritual. Um, so that's one depiction, plus his kind of off colors, I don't know, the grays and the, the blues and the um, not as bright, but those are some things that I think of when I think of when it comes to El Greco. So he would go on in Toledo to flourish. He would get multiple um, uh, commissions. They kind of mentioned that, um, I forget what the name of the guy who ended up kind of taking him in and, and promoting him, but there was a count in, it wasn't the guy that died the portrait, but another one that uh, take, took him in and really helped get him commissions and helped him flourish. Um, but there's no doubt that a great uh, influence. And his last painting was called The Adoration of the Shepherds, and it was for his own tomb uh, in 1614. And it kind of, they say it kind of summarizes his spiritual convictions. They kind of show this uh, Christ radiating. And one of the other things they mentioned, he started off in Crete as an icon uh, artist. So they mentioned his use of light, whereas Caravaggio and some of those naturalists, they would really get into the light. Caravaggio, we're gonna see that intensely. But um, he was influenced, El Greco, by the, um, the icons, which remember the light kind of comes from the, the image themselves. There's no shadows, there's no sense of light coming from one side or the other. The light kind of emanates from the objects. And so that was a consistent influence or a distinctive characteristic of El Greco. So the Christ child in this last painting of the Adoration of the Shepherds, kind of this uh, radiates this unearthly luminous glow they mentioned. He's surrounded by the shepherds, the Holy Family. This is how they end it and I will end it too. Above them, clouds of angels rejoice, inviting the viewer to join El Greco in adoration and worship of the newborn king. So El Greco, another famous person, they kind of mentioned that he didn't uh, grow in fame really until uh, the 20th century that even at his time, he wasn't as well appreciated, but artists like Picasso, who really had a profound uh, appreciation of him, helped El Greco kind of be elevated in art history, so to speak. So there's El Greco for you. As I mentioned, we're gonna go on to our next one, The Incred Incredulity of St. Thomas. So the unbelief, if you will, by Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio, better known as Caravaggio, uh, pa painting from 1601 to 1602. So that'll be next for our masterpieces. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day and God bless.